Uh, so good morning. I'm Peter Crowley. I'm the Community Safety Officer at Mooney Valley City Council. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you today about our Household Safety Plan, uh, which is a resource we developed to promote and support household safety. I'm trying to move on to my next slide and it's not wanting to do it. I'm sorry, Megan, I can't get the thing to move to the next slide. Ah. Okay, so Mooney Valley's Household Safety Plan is a resource we developed to support our residents to be safe in emergency situations. Um, so what do we know about household safety? Um, Mooney Valley conducts research amongst our community on an annual basis and we ask questions about perceptions of safety and our community tells us that they put a high priority on safety but also that they feel safest during the daytime at home and the place they feel least safe is out in public spaces, particularly at night, places like in parks or on public transport stops. However, what we do know in fact is that their perception and the reality are not matched and that in actual fact they are more at risk at home than they are in those public places that they're so fearful of. Evidence tells us that cry, um, sorry, home is the most likely setting for preventable, preventable injury and also for incidences of crime. Injury and crime statistics in Victoria and in our municipality show us that injury and accident are much more likely in the home than in the public place. Uh, in actual fact, home accidents are four times more common than, for example, a road accident. Um, and people are even more likely to be victims of crime in their own home than they might be in the public realm as well. In Mooney Valley in particular, our crime and safety issues that affect householders um, are in the area of unintentional injury. Um, falls are the leading cause of hospital admissions in Victoria and, and in Mooney Valley accounting for about 45% of um, hospital admissions. We also have significant home safety issues in relation to heat wave, uh, particularly affecting older residents. Um, incidences of violence, uh, including family violence. Burns and scalds and poisonings, including overdose, are second and third on the list of most common causes for hospital admission. And house fires are another um, significant household safety issue and in particular uh, there is a correlation to victims that we might consider to at times be vulnerable such as uh, our seniors, young children, people who are new to the area and perhaps don't know the uh, amenity of the area and in that I also include um, newly arrived residents from refugee circumstances or from other countries. Women have particular vulnerability, especially in relation to family violence and the weekend warrior, handy men who are um, a bit inclined to be over adventurous as they go about their home uh, renovation and home projects. Mooney Valley is an inner urban municipality so it uh, commences just a few kilometres out of the city centre of Melbourne and spreads out to about 15 kilometres from the city centre. People who live in Mooney Valley live in a range of housing types. There are standalone homes, some of them um, almost a century old and some newer. We have, uh, as shown in the lower left of the slide, some public housing tenancies for uh, our housing commission. And increasingly we're seeing more and more um, multi and medium storey apartment buildings that can have anything from 20 to 80 dwellings within the one building. And the genesis of this particular project was uh, trying to work out how we can provide people in these new communities and new dwelling types with vital household safety information. In terms of our population, uh, in Mooney Valley, as you can see, there are about 40.9% of our households are occupied by families with children. 
we have 25% of households that are occupied by lone residents and in many cases these are older residents and we have about 23% of residents that are couples. We have a considerable portion of our population that comes from migrant origins, um, speaking languages other than English and uh, there are a considerable number of different um, ethnicities represented in that uh, mix including Vietnamese, Cantonese, Mandarin, Arabic and Somali and our population um, dynamic changes frequently. We have a large portion of our population which uh, is in the 60 plus age group and uh, a growing number of young children but approximately half of the population is in the 25 to 50 year age bracket. So this is all relevant information to consider in terms of just what the safety needs of our community might be. And what we also know about safety is that the safety of every individual and every individual household uh, is some sort of a balance between um, certain factors which put their safety at risk and the protective factors that they have in place. And so those risk factors, for example, can be situational things like uh, where their home is even located in terms of whether it's low-lying and flood-prone or whether the house is an older house through to personal factors such as uh, low levels of education or low levels of income. All of these are potentially things that can compromise or risk household safety. In balance, protective factors can tend to be things such as um, people's education and indeed whatever education we can give them in terms of building their capacity. Uh, the resources that they have in their home, things such as having smoke alarms or having a first aid kit in your house is a protective factor to supporting household safety. And then there can be uh, local uh, interventions, things such as um, support services from organisations such as our state emergency service or local interventions even such as the construction of a levy bank in a flood prone area can be protective factors. So all of these things were um, things that we looked at and considered as we worked out what was the way to support our community to be safe at home. And what we also discovered when we did some of our research was that there was a great number of different types of resources that the community could access such as the pamphlet pictured on the left which is just an image plot from the web and that is a, a resource that's full of information. And equally there was quite a number of things like the one on the right which is a, a resource for people to fill out their own information to have at hand in the event of an emergency. But what we identified was there wasn't really any resource that married both of these things into one and that's what we've done in the production of our household safety plan. Our household safety plan has a combination of um, household information that and supportive information to assist people in an emergency and um, places where they can enter information that it's useful to have at hand during an emergency. So what's inside it? Okay, and um, you're able to access this resource to look at it on the Mooney Valley website, more about that later. But obviously the first thing we needed to include there were the key pieces of local information that would support people in an emergency and that included things such as contact numbers and local addresses for police stations and hospitals, uh, numbers to call for immediate assistance such as ambulance services um, and nurse on call and indeed our own services as a council. We have services that kick in particularly in relation to things like um, lighting issues or, or, or neighbourhood issues to do with flooding and water. So all of that um, information in the form of phone numbers and addresses is in our household safety plan. We also have links and numbers of the broader levels of support that people might wish to access and that's things such as um, violence helplines, gambling helplines, Beyond Blue for people with uh, situations of depression, um, Lifeline and youth support and uh, the Muni Valley Community Safety Register which is listed there or indicated there with all those hands which is a resource in which vulnerable community members can have their details registered with police and that will give them the um, benefit of having a regular contact to check up on their wellbeing particularly on days when there are issues such as um, inclement weather or heatwave. 
vitally important also is that we have links to translation services. We also have helpful information inside the resource, including things like uh, what sort of equipment should go into a household first aid kit, how to assemble and keep a home emergency kit in the event of um, your home being stranded without power for a period of time, um, torches, radios, first aid, water, food, and even things such as how to, not just simply that you should turn off the gas in the event of a fire, but the simple stuff of that which way to turn the tap. So we've loaded that sort of information into the resource as well. And additionally, there is a, a substantial amount of space within the resource for people to record their household information. And this is things such as uh, the names, dates of births, mobile contact numbers of people where they work or their school contact numbers. Um, details in relation to particular medications that people might need, um, agreed household information such as their um, identified escape route in the event of a fire, uh, a place that they could all meet to reunite if they were separated at a particular time, um, a common contact point if they can't contact each other, they could all contact uh, an aunt or a relative places for them to record information such as the details of their insurers, their doctors, uh, their medical providers, their utility providers in case they need to uh, contact these people to arrange for suspension of services or to deal with um, issues relating from those services. So all in all, our resource, which is some 16 pages long, has this um, broad combination of personal information and local information. At the point that we developed this resource, we sought input and, and uh, indeed uh, editing and comment from a range of other agencies we work closely with, including uh, our local police services, the Victorian Safe Communities Network, and the Safety Centre at the Royal Children's Hospital. We thought it was um, useful and important to make sure that we had other eyes look at our resource so that we hadn't omitted anything or uh, provided insufficient detail. So how is this made available? Uh, the resource is made available to our community in two forms. It's available as an interactive PDF on our website and uh, the web address is given there. And it's also available as a hard printed copy. The printed copy of course particularly suits our older residents. Um, and it's simply one that you begin to write all your own information into. The PDF is a useful alternative because it's very easily edited and changed. So if a family member has a change of circumstances, for example, a student moves out of primary school into secondary school, you can go back and change the school details without having to resort to erasers or um, correction tape or start a new copy. The PDF one is also uh, easily stored online, which means it can be accessed in other places, particularly if you have things like um, a house fire and you lose your possessions. But we see that each of them is a useful um, way to provide the information. And we also know that even if people don't fill anything into this document, it contains useful information. And the more they add to it in terms of their own personal details, the more useful it becomes. We've made the resource available both in hard copy and print form in our council facilities. Um, it's also available in local police stations across our municipality, uh, in our municipal libraries, and there are four across Mooney Valley, and into a range of community centres where people can access it. Um, so it's also promoted in these places. And we've also had um, specific instruction around using it and, and its um, delivery uh, in a range of um, forums, including sessions that are targeting seniors, uh, annexed onto um, presentations through our local crime prevention officer at police. And um, in some of our communities where we have significant numbers of migrant um, residents, we have the resource being used as a teaching resource in language classes so that people are actually completing and filling out the information at the same time that they are learning English and uh, that's a way of helping it um, 
provide a benefit to people for whom English isn't the first language. Now, the, pro the project is, um, in a sense, well advanced in that we have the resource developed and distributed, but we're not necessarily stopping there. We need to continue to promote it. There are um, over 100,000 people and some 25,000 households in our area, so we have a lot of um, people to reach. And we're looking at continuing to deliver it through information sessions, so rather than merely give it to people to um, provide supportive explanation about how it is used and, and the benefit of it. And we're also looking at continuing to develop other versions in other languages. Indeed, what we have realised is that all of the content that is in the book, um, about 90% of it, is broadly generic. The support agencies numbers, for example, apply to any Victorian municipality. Um, the household information is specific to each household, so those blank template sections work for every household, and there is really only about uh, one-tenth of the content which is Mooney Valley specific. So moving forward, as we develop versions in other languages, we have the opportunity to reach out to other municipalities to say that here is this block of safety information that has been translated into, for example, Vietnamese or Mandarin that would work very well in your community if you have a large number of people who speak that language and that you can make a bespoke version by merely adding the 10% of local content that makes it specific to your municipality. So Mooney Valley is very happy to talk to other agencies that might like to uh, build upon this resource and use what we've developed but tailor a local version of it. And that's the essence of our project and I'm happy to take any questions. So if anyone has any questions, if you wanted to put your hand up, I can make sure that you're unmuted and that you can actually ask Peter a question. I'd like to say, first of all, that that's a great resource, Peter, and a great opportunity to be able to work with uh, other groups as well to um, get those translations made. Thank you. Anna, did you have, have a question? Anna? No, it doesn't. Yes, it is. Anna Schmidt, you have a question? You're on, I've unmuted you, so we should be able to hear you. No, she's not. Let me see if I can find her question and ask. Anna's question is, did you consider making this using an app? Um, we have not yet considered that, to be honest. Um, it certainly is a useful idea, and I thank you, Anna, for proposing it. But um, and I, I certainly feel that, that that would be a a good extension of the project in the sense that people carry their phones with them, so an app would be um, very suitable. I, guess for reasons of budget and also to build um, awareness and strength around what we already have, we're, uh, we're sort of not taking it further yet in that regard. We think that um, our task now is having got the resort resource produced is to build awareness of it, to continue to promote it and to make it available to the, the members of our community for whom English isn't a first language. But the idea of an app is certainly um, a great idea and one that um, I thank you for suggesting. <laughs> okay, now we have Cheryl Tiamo. Cheryl, you had a question? Okay, she might be another one who doesn't actually have a speaker but she has her hand up. So um, we'll get Cheryl to email that question through. We might actually, let me just check that there are no other questions. So we might actually move on to our next presenter. So thank you, Peter, for that. That was really interesting. And there's an email address there for people if they wish to send a question to me. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move on to Liz Lambert from Safer Napier who, with her presentation on Safer's Houses. 
Yes, hello. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. This is my first webinar, so it seems a little odd, but hopefully it goes well. Um, so I guess sort of following on from Peter, um, that in, here in Napier in New Zealand we have similar stats um, that over half the ACC claims are from injuries in the home and also theft, um, burglary and theft from cars is about a third of our Napier crime. Um, so we um, have have developed a Safest Houses project which is based on the Tauranga one. We even have the icon here. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to sort of run through it. We work on a results-based accountability framework. Um, so we've done, well, I did the evaluation on it um, using that. So I'll sort of just use that as my base. Um, there's many other people to thank who actually did the work. Um, yeah. So just for those of you who don't know, um, Napier is in the North Island on the East Coast out there. Okay. So, um, just RBA stuff, what did we do? Uh, so that's looking, this was a home safety program, a collaborative one, so we've got the council, fire, police, uh, neighbourhood support, ACC, uh, Safer Napier, and uh, civil defence. Um, and it's basically around raising awareness of safety issues, um, and where possible making, you know, small changes. Uh, so as you'll see, sorry, I'm probably talking too fast, uh, from the invite, looking at crime prevention, fire safety, injury prevention, and also our civil defence readiness. So the program starts off, people receive a flyer in the mail, um, and then they start with, door-to-door -door home safety audits. So it starts with the policeman going in, so people don't need to worry. Odd person does worry. Um, and then we've got a team that come through and they've just got sort of a list of questions and some things are just um, observations. Uh, might go through questions, but have you got door locks and window locks? Do they work? Have you got sufficient lighting? Um, in the evening security lighting, looking at smoke alarms, um, is the heating clear of any obstructions, you know, your curtains, your things like that. Just run through multi boards if any are over um, overloaded, are your ladders in good condition, do you have a get ready, um, get through kit. There, there's a list um, that they just sort of check on through and and then that's um, there'll be some actions perhaps identified from that most houses do that people can go through um, and either do themselves or the agencies involved help run them and with from this they might come with some street working bees um, for garden work trimming trees removing graffiti um, and with all sort of good community development stuff, there's a street barbecue a few days later to promote neighbours getting to know each other. Um, they can come and discuss with the um, agencies any other issues they might have or if there are any other resources to hand out. Um, this include um, start-up get-ready kits or Everybody got like a bath mat, health injury prevention, and some other things. So that's sort of going quickly through the thing. Um, they always make sure the home assessments are quite quick, um, so it's not too intrusive. So then looking at how well did we do it. Um, so the things we've looked at, um, sort of measure that is households participating. Um, so we've done this in two areas, two different areas of Napier. Um, we had 33 households uh, the first time, that's 
of the street and 40 households, 78% of the street. Um, so it wasn't compulsory, but most people take you up on the offer. Uh, the agencies and groups involved, so as I said earlier, we had the council, ACC, police, fire, and our Napier Neighbourhood Support. Uh, Housing New Zealand was involved um, when it was their houses. And then looking at the safety areas covered, um, so because you know working collaboratively in the safe communities model, um, if you're already into the house, it's good to um, cover lots of bases. So we've got crime, fire, injury, um, and your emergency management. Uh, all the home safety assessors were appropriately trained, um, and everyone surveyed was very happy with how polite and professional everyone was. Um, looked at the follow-up actions from the agencies. So these were things like um, smoke alarms. There was trimming of, of branches and things like that. Uh, we ran a customer satisfaction survey, which was 100%. Um, the, the program is sort of run over a week. Uh, so between they normally come in on a Tuesday to do the home assessments and the Thursday to look at the barbecue and the follow-up work. Each street cost about $3,000. I'll get into the next slide. So is anyone better off? So often the harder question to answer than just how much you did. We looked at the five performance measures around awareness, perception of safety, injury rate, crime rate, uh, and then our community resilience and connections. So we're looking at raised awareness of safety issues. Um, all the homes were given the key safety messages um, and then any additional information based on the needs or the situation. So as you see on the slide, um, so for the two different areas, 50 and then 64 percent had made additional changes to improve their safety. Um, so these were the ones they personally did um, rather than the agencies doing them for them. And they included things like replacing smoke alarm batteries, installing extra door locks, um, changing bulbs, trimming shrubs. Um, the groups were given out one of those UV pens so you can write on your possessions and people can't see them. Um, so people were marking their things. Uh, another measure looking at increased perception of safety in the target community. And so that uh, 43 and 44% felt safer after being part of safest houses. Uh, and the rest of them felt the same. So then another performance measure, we looked at the hospital and injury admissions. Um, yeah, uh, and so that went from two to zero in one area and the other area just remained at zero. We also looked at total reported crime. Um, so these are, as you see, these are provisional data, but uh, first area went from eight to three and the other one from zero to one. Um, so and then in this area, it was people feeling more confident to report in uh, what was going on. And that I guess one of the bigger things is people were looking out for each other and um, watching what was going on. Also to do with the crime prevention, uh, looking at the SEPTED crime prevention through environmental design principles. Um, like what an earlier presentation did at uh, the last webinar last year, um, but on a smaller scale. So these are just some pictures here, pruning back some trees to improve sight lines. Uh, and then looking at the community resilience and connection. Um, so is anyone better off here? Um, looking at 
the civil defence line. So obviously, the, um, a lot of get ready, get through kits um, have been established. There was some start up given out for people who didn't already have it, and just raised awareness of what should go in it, including the water. Um, then, and also another example here are neighbourhood groups that have been established. So uh, I think there was one in the first area and two in the second area. Uh, so that just sort of indicates that the communities are getting to know each other, becoming more aware. Yeah, and um, yeah, thinking about their safety and how how to be more safe. Um, so I've run through that quite quickly because um, it's quite <laughs> it's a bit different when you don't get feedback. Um, but my name's Liz Lambert, so I'm the Safe and Nature Coordinator. Uh, this is my email address if you think of any questions or if you want to have a look at the evaluation or any of the resources. Yeah, I guess I just thank take you. Questions. Thank Yep, thanks Liz. I do have one question that someone's already sent through, so if anyone else wants to ask one, please either put your hand up or write the question. The question was around the cost and where do the funds yep. come from to run the program and do householders pay anything? Oh, okay, um, so it was free to the householders and it was funded through ACC and Ministry of Justice. Okay, Yeah. thank you. And does anyone else, it doesn't look like anyone else has a question at this point. So I'd say thank you very much, Liz. It was really interesting and good to see how you've used what was already existing in another area and translated that into your community. And I think that's one of the things that um, people need to continue to look at, what's working well somewhere else and how that can be adapted um, in your area. So thank you very much yeah. for that. Um, just wanted to go back and say apologies for the audio issues that we had earlier and I'll make sure that the chainsaw safety presentation is online uh, as well as this session. So I wanted to, on behalf of all the participants, thank our presenters today. Please feel free to email them any follow-up questions that you might have. And the reminder that the webinar has been recorded will be available uh, next week and please feel free to share this with any of your colleagues. Our next webinar on youth initiatives will be held on the 28th of May and speaker details will be circulated closer to the event. We encourage you to complete the survey at the end of the session or in the follow-up email and continue to let us know the topics that you find most useful. So thank you to all participants for today and being part of the webinar and enjoy the rest of your day.